and I think for me, the new normal is, is taking a, a lot fewer things for granted. Um, you know, I think it's, it's brought us face to face with our own mortality uh, yeah. and the mortality of those around us and our loved ones. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's brought us face to face with how we, how we use our time. Uh, and I think you know, time is one of the most valuable things that we have and how we allocate that, where we choose to, to focus our time and talents. Is, is, is very important. And I think, you know, so many of us, you know, myself included, um, got into a mode where we were just kind of going with the flow. Life, life puts us on a certain path. And then we simply go from one day to the next without actively, you know, reflecting on the what we're doing and the why. This special episode of the Paris Talks podcast features a former corporate guy turned entrepreneur. Christopher Crime is the co-founder and CEO of Outcome, a Paris-based startup that leverages collective intelligence and technology to change the way firms work together. Prior to launching Outcome, Christopher spent two decades with BNP Paribas in Europe and the United States in roles ranging from corporate finance to client coverage. Christopher was in Paris during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, that's before it was called COVID-19. That's also when it was still considered, quote, a Chinese affair. Things went so fast that a month later, Christopher found himself in his country house with a family, adapting to remote working, homeschooling, meditating, and other quickly developed habits to keep his mental and physical sanity intact. If we were to start a new normal, what and how should it be? That's the question we are asking Christopher today. And while he's a huge fan of technological advancements, he believes there is no way we should put aside and undermine human interactions if we were to design a new normal. Welcome to yet another episode of the Paris Talks podcast. This season of the Paris Talks podcast is trying to understand the past COVID-19's new normal through inspiring stories and testimonies from innovators, community influencers, and policy designers. My name is uh, Chris Cramey, and uh, I am uh, the co-founder and CEO of a tech startup called Outcome, where we're using technology and collective intelligence to change the way firms work together. Um, I launched Outcome at the beginning of the year after two decades uh, in, in the corporate world, where I had a, a very international uh, career, um, but uh, Felt the desire to launch a, a more entrepreneurial venture and go down that path in my career, uh, given a passion about uh, about really building things and uh, and learning each day. I was born in uh, in the U.S. in uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, which is a city of about 600,000 people uh, that uh, not many people here in Europe uh, know. Uh, it uh, has the first presidential primaries, uh, the caucuses uh, every four years, and so uh, tends to be in the news then. But otherwise, is uh, is a, a mid-sized Midwestern uh, city. Uh, I then moved to Washington D.C. for college uh, before uh, before coming to Paris uh, a first time 20 years ago. And after a few years in Paris, I went back to the U.S. to San Francisco, uh, then came back uh, to Paris uh, for four years and then three years in Brussels, and have been back here in Paris since uh, the end of 2016. So I've lived in uh, in a lot of different places, but in my old job, I was I was traveling. Um, really all over the world, throughout Europe, Africa, Asia, North America. And, uh, you know, I think obviously there's, there's all the lessons about, uh, uh, about diversity and our, our, our common points that Wayne, our, our, our differences. Uh, um, but I think, you know, what, what I probably retain um, personally is that, uh, is, is that it's, it's really important in life to remain curious. If we don't maintain that, that, that curiosity about the world around us, uh, and particularly those that inhabit it, 
you know, you just you 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 fail to really appreciate the 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 magic of uh, of our world and our in our societies. And so I think that uh, probably that need to uh, stay curious uh, is is the biggest and most uh, important lesson for me. Inside Wuhan, inside one of its makeshift hospitals, every patient here is suspected of having COVID-19, including Li Xiaoxiong, a 29-year-old local. When Wuhan was locked down at the end of January, a city of 11 million people quarantined, Miss Li started volunteering. That work was dangerous, and as a result, Miss Li got sick. This is her being tested for COVID-19. She transmitted the infection to her parents, who are in a stable condition. Well, I think I think like uh, everybody else, um, towards towards the end of last year, we started hearing about what was happening in in Wuhan, uh, and uh, uh, and and observing that, but really really from a distance. I think we all thought it would be similar to SARS or or or, or previous viruses that would certainly have a risk of circulation, um, and there would be some travel restrictions and uh, airport screenings and those types of things. But, um, you know, at, at, at the time, I saw it largely as an event taking place halfway around the world. You know, I think, I think at the time I was, I was in the process of launching the startup, and so I was not traveling nearly as much as I, as I used to, but uh, still had a lot of friends and, and old colleagues who were, who were traveling. And, uh, you know, I think you saw, you saw companies starting to warn their employees to you know, cut back on travel a bit. And so, you know, there were some, there were some early signs that um, things, uh, you know, might, might be more serious than in, in, in the previous cases I, I mentioned. And then I think it was really when we started to see the situation in Italy that, um, that we all thought that, uh, wow, this is, this is something different. Après avoir consulté, écouté, les experts, le terrain et en conscience, j'ai décidé de renforcer encore les mesures pour réduire nos déplacements et nos contacts au strict nécessaire. Dès demain midi et pour 15 jours au moins, nos déplacements seront très fortement réduits. Cela signifie que les regroupements extérieurs, les réunions familiales ou amicales ne seront plus permises. Se promener, retrouver ses amis dans le parc, dans la rue, ne sera plus possible. Il s'agit de limiter au maximum ses contacts au-delà du foyer. Partout sur le territoire français, en métropole comme outre-mer, seuls doivent demeurer les trajets nécessaires. Nécessaires pour aller faire ses courses, avec de la discipline et en mettant les distances d'au moins un mètre, en ne serrant pas la main, en n'embrassant pas. Les trajets nécessaires pour se soigner, évidemment. Les trajets nécessaires pour aller travailler quand le travail à distance n'est pas possible. Et les trajets nécessaires pour faire un peu d'activité physique, mais sans retrouver, là encore, des amis ou des proches. Toutes les entreprises doivent s'organiser pour faciliter le travail à distance. Et quand cela ne sera pas possible, elles devront adapter dès demain leur organisation pour faire respecter ces gestes barrières contre le virus, c'est-à-dire protéger leurs salariés ou quand il s'agit d'indépendants, se protéger eux-mêmes. Le gouvernement précisera les modalités de ces nouvelles règles dès ce soir, dès après mon allocution. Toute infraction à ces règles sera sanctionnée. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think in, I think in France, we, we sort of knew what to expect because we had seen what had happened in, in China and in, and in Italy. I think the big question was, um, you know, everybody realizes or, or, or can understand the scientific importance of, of isolation and, and how to stop the spread of a, of a pandemic. And, and I think you know, those lessons go back to you know, 1918. The big question is, is well, okay, what is the form that this takes in each in each country? And I think, uh, yeah, the contrast even between China and Italy was 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 important because we we, we have the impression of, of you know China as a as a 
country where the state is very much in control, uh, can uh, uh, implement uh, rules, uh, everybody's followed by cameras, fines are automatic, uh, um, you know, and that it's, it's very much a, a lockdown state if they want to do that. Um, Italy is very different. I mean, uh, the, cult, the culture in Italy is, uh, you know, with, without asking people to wear masks, um, you know, you go to Rome, getting people to simply obey basic traffic laws is already a challenge. And, uh, and, and so I think you see this arriving in the West and you ask, okay, how is it going to, how is it going to play out? Um, but then you started seeing the image of Italy where, you know, there was a tremendous amount of, of discipline and one of the most, you know, social countries and cultures in Europe, people were you know, staying in their apartments, they were staying home, uh, they were waiting in line outside of supermarkets. It was just this massive shift. And so I think, uh, you know, that that was the biggest indication of what things would be like uh, when when uh, President Macron here got on the got on the television and uh, and announced the, uh, the confinement. The big the big question is, OK, how long is it going to how long is it going to last? Which, of course, nobody nobody knew. Uh, and what's what's kind of the best strategy to to ride it out? You know, and there were kind of personal and, and, and professional considerations. Uh, we, we had just uh, hired our first uh, our first two employees uh, for, for the company and they started March 1st. And so, you know, this is two two weeks into it. So there's there's that series of concerns. There's OK, how do you how do you manage at home with uh, remote schooling and what's that going to look like? And um, and uh, we, we, we have uh, uh, the good, the good fortune to um, when when we moved to Paris some years ago, uh, we bought a place near my uh, near my in laws in the countryside, and uh, so the the question we had is okay as a family where do we want to ride this out do we want to stay in Paris or do we want to go to the country and uh, and we ended up making the choice to uh, to get out of the city actually. Parisians thronged the city's rail stations and took to the highway early on Tuesday to escape the French capital before a lockdown imposed to slow the rate of coronavirus contagion kicked in at midday. The Paris exodus drew dismay from provincial France, where many fear that city dwellers will bring the virus with them and accelerate its spread. Health minister said the government had no intention of preventing people traveling to secondary residences but said the stringent restrictions on public life would apply on the coast as they would in the city. It was very different um, than if we had stayed uh, stayed in the city, and and it gave us quite a bit more quite a bit more freedom and sunshine and, and air, which uh, which uh, for me was was super helpful. But it also I think forced us to think about how how the day is 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 structured, and how to live in a world where you no longer have a separation between sort of your your professional life and your your personal life. I had. Uh, I had never really worked from home before, aside from you know, catching up on some work evenings and weekends. Um, and so that was kind of a series of adaptations. It was having the kids at home with remote schooling. It was launching a new startup and trying to build a culture and interaction with the team while we are far away from each other. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then it was just, you know, kind of personally, how do you keep the right balance and, 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 and focus and concentration and, and and try and put your day together in the best possible way. And so for me, I'd say it was a, it was a time of lots of experimentation um, and, and also a time where I had a lot more freedom to think about how I, how I structured what, what I was doing, um, both in terms of, 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 of work, uh, my role as a, as a father, uh, and, and just kind of my own personal well, well-being. And so what I would typically do is I would get up uh, relatively early. Um, I would uh, go outside, do, do a bit of, of, of reading, a little bit of exercise, uh, some, some meditation, um, then have breakfast. And the mornings for us were really, uh, you know, I'd say work focused. Um, the kids typically had about half of a day of, 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 of schoolwork to do. Uh, and then after lunch, uh, it was it was back to work, but then with a clear break towards the end of the afternoon, uh, and and to try and do a, a physical activity as uh, uh, with with the kids. And so if it was inside, it could be uh, you know doing some 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 CrossFit on the TV or something. Or if it was outside, it was simply you know jogging around the the garden or doing some work in the garden or or, or some sports activities, um, and then. You know, dinner and then the evenings, um, which was a mix of 
you know, I'd say kind of more traditional activities. I think we played more board games than we uh, than we had in, in years. And so that was that was definitely a good thing. Um, but when I talk about kind of realizing how how I structured my day, I, I, did, I did a lot of reading during that period. And one one of the books I really enjoyed was um, was a book called When by Dan Pink, who goes into research on our biological clocks and, and, and how we uh, how we perform it with different types of tasks at different times during the day. And and I think it was an opportunity as we were confined to be very deliberate about how we structured our days because we were less, maybe less dependent on others. Um, our daily agendas were less driven by you know, meetings and client calls and outside stimulus. Uh, and so I started to think about, okay, what do I do really well in the morning and allocate kind of more creative tasks uh, towards, towards the morning hours. And I realized that the early afternoon for me was kind of a dead time. And so that would be focused more on kind of administrative type tasks. And then, you know, I would get an additional boost in the, in, in the evening. And so I started adapting my schedule towards that as well and found that it was, uh, was actually a, a pretty good way to stay productive and actually in some ways be, be more productive. Fortunately, nobody in my uh, immediate uh, family, but um, I certainly knew people who were who were affected. I had uh, you know, former former colleagues who uh, you know were, were were sick for several weeks. I had a good friend whose whose father passed away early on during during the confinement period, and uh, and, and and yes, I was certainly aware of, of of people both both here, but also in other countries where I have friends uh, back home in the U.S. Uh, obviously, where 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 cases spiked uh, very, very quickly. In fact, today, I'm not sure if I've met anybody who doesn't know someone who was who was affected by, by the disease. A new study from Harvard Business School says geographic flexibility can save money for businesses and staffers. Researchers found employees who work remotely raised revenue and productivity and boosted their local economy. LinkedIn estimates since 2016 there has been a 78 percent increase in job postings that mention work flexibility. LinkedIn senior editor at large Jesse Hempel is here. Jesse, good morning. Good morning. So is there, there's always this idea that if you work from home, you're kind of lazy, you're on the couch watching CBS this morning on or you're or, or you're on oh. the beach or, or you're, you're at the on beach. the beach well listen there's there's nothing wrong with watching CBS this morning That's exactly that right true. but that exactly is right. not what remote workers are doing when they're working they're working yeah so what's happening what did you guys find so what we're finding is that people increasingly want to be expect to be able to work from wherever they want to work and when we're talking about remote workers Maybe you're thinking about someone who works from home, and that's yes. part of it, but that's not all of it. Increasingly, people are choosing to live in different cities than they work in. Sure. But, but isn't there some benefit in face-to-face -face interaction with your colleagues and certainly with your boss? I would think yeah. it would be very hard to get promoted if you don't have face-to-face -face interaction. How do people navigate around that? Well, Gail, I think what you're getting at is mentorship and relationships. And just as if you are in the office, if you are working remotely, you have to build those. The thing about working remotely is you have to work harder to do it. So whether it is getting into the office on a quarterly basis and making sure to schedule lunches with people to get to know them. If I look at kind of the, 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 the different pieces that came together, so yes, it was a big professional change for me. It was a, a, a an interesting time for the team I work with because we were just coming together and starting to work together when this uh, when this hit. And I think what I realized is that so we're, we're in, the, in, in the tech space with a team that is very digitally savvy. We had all of, all of the tools we needed to collaborate, um, organize our work. Uh, we had our virtual stand-up meetings. We, we worked in an agile mode with two-week sprints, and we have daily stand-up meetings every morning that we were doing um, via, via video. Um, so there was plenty of sharing of information, I think, compared to you know, less, less digital work environments. But I think what that allowed me to discern were, was really the, the limits of, of remote working and the importance of human interaction for a team. Mm -hmm. um, because in a way we, we, for us, all the tools worked, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have the processes or, you know, we weren't in a, we weren't in a physical setting where our business relied on, you know, selling things to our customers in a, in a store or, or, or a restaurant or, or something like that. Um, so on paper, we, we were in the category of, of people who should have been most able to adapt. And I think we did, 
Um, but it definitely went more slowly. And I think it went more slowly because we were at a time where we needed to build the culture of the team, uh, learn how to work together uh, and, and create together. And uh, I think that activity of creation of building um, is, is, is much, much more efficient and a lot more fun uh, when, uh, when, when you're together. And uh, you know, when the confinement period came to an end and we could progressively start you know being physically together i think it was a lot of it was not just you know that we we started um moving faster on on the technology we were building but there was a lot more joy in 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 the actual work and i think we we tend to forget but uh the work environment is 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 one of our primary if not our primary social interaction during the week There's a lot of things that we've taken for granted that we, you know, will not be the same in the future. Um, you know, I think, uh, and, and that has some good impacts. I think, uh, you know, if I go back to my, my old life, there were times when I was hopping on an airplane and, and, and flying halfway around the world and doing two meetings and then coming back. And, uh, and in kind of the international corporate world, that was very, very common. Um, you know, that, that has major costs environmentally. Uh, and it has major costs in terms of work-life balance and on the people. You know, I don't, I don't think we'll ever go back to that. And that's, that's probably a very good thing. If my, uh, if, if my father, who's in his 80s, is now for the first time comfortable doing grocery shopping online and interacting with his friends and family via Zoom, uh, you know, that's a, that's a positive outcome of, sure. of this pandemic. Uh, and, and so I think... I think, you know, that's, that's definitely one thing. Um, the, uh, the other thing, however, is we see this crisis bringing out a lot of themes we've been talking about for the last five years or so around, around populism, around fake news, around the difficulty for Western societies in particular um, to place value on the collective as opposed to the individual. Uh, and, you know, when you see kind of the the blatant ignorance of, of scientific regarding scientific recommendations uh, when you see you know, social media feeds and some of what's coming coming out and and just the failure to recognize kind of the risk that individual behavior can have on on, on others uh, you know it's just it's just one one more sign of, of a really problematic trend uh, in in our societies today that we've seen, you know, spill out first on social networks, then into our politics, which progressively invades a lot of aspects of our of our lives. Um, yeah. I don't know what the answer to that is, um, mm. to be honest. Um, but but I think it's I think it's you know yet another wake up call. Pandemic is a word that, if misused, can cause unreasonable fear or unjustified acceptance that the fight is over, leading to unnecessary suffering and death. Life pretty much froze after this day. There are new COVID-19 cases in North Texas. And it is spreading fast. Declaring a state disaster. Fort Worth Mayor Betsy Price is expected to announce a stay-at-home order. Dallas County will move to a safer-at-home order. Our world turned upside down, forcing us to change our ways forcing us to be by ourselves and focus on our health because we had nowhere to be. What if I told you that in the city, the streets were empty? Would you believe me? What if I told you schools shut down and businesses closed too? Even stadiums weren't rocking like they used to. Would you believe me? We hear words like isolation, social distancing, the lockdown, to wash our hands since they can harm us. To keep six feet, we don't know who to trust. The fear turns into greed, so we take more than we need. But we're all in this together. We're all connected, all equally affected. Yeah, when we say the new, the new normal, it's, it's, it's at once uh, uh, a call to change and a certain nostalgia for stability. And, uh, you know, I think I think what we what we all realize is that we live in a very volatile and, and, and changing 
world. And to think that, oh, well, this will be over and then we'll go back to normal, which might be different, but it will be normal and will last that way. I'm, I'm, I think that might be kind of, kind of naive. You know, I think that uh, we live in a world where uh, there's a lot of change and there's a lot of change all the time. And I think it's for, it's, it's a challenge for modern society to find its, uh, to find its anchors, um, to find its, 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 its roots. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the, that's one of the lessons maybe, you know, that I've, I've realized as, a, as an expat, uh, the world is so, suddenly seems a lot bigger than it used to be. And, uh, you know, I feel a little bit like my, my grandfather who was an immigrant and, uh, you know, his, his, his interaction with his family was, you know, written letters that took weeks to arrive. You know, we've, we've gotten so used to the idea where, mm -hmm. oh, well, you can hop on a plane and yes, the ticket might be expensive, but, you know, relatively speaking, things were, things were very, uh, were, were, were very easy. You know, I think that that has changed, but this concept of, of new normal, I think it's for each of us to define. And, and that's probably all the volatility right now is probably a good opportunity to do that. I think uh, what's important for us and what do we come back to in terms of our, uh, our our values and what's and what's important and how we maintain that regardless of you know what happens in the uh, uh, in the world around us. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's it's interesting because I had lunch uh, a few days ago with a with a good friend and, and mentor of mine, uh, a gentleman who had uh, who has had because he's he's still working actively. You know, very successful career, but uh, but a career which has allowed him to develop a lot of a lot of wisdom. And one of his big questions, as he was reflecting on kind of the lessons, was you know whether whether or not the pandemic has lasted long enough. Um, well, now we, now when you see the trend of COVID cases, maybe he has his answer that uh, that it's going to last for for a while longer. But his question is, you know, have people really had time to digest what's happening, um, and that it has had. Uh, a, a deep enough impact on their lives that it actually drives change. And I think one, one, one kind of or, or, or reflection that I had that, that, that really comes back to me now is somebody once said that uh, uh, the days are long and the years are short. And I think we've, we've gotten into this model, especially during the confinement, where our days like structure, it seemed like we had to reinvent things all the time. And, and, and then we look back and, you know, I'm, I'm now reconnecting with friends or seeing people that I hadn't seen in, you know, six months, nine months, et cetera. And it feels like yesterday. And, and I think the risk is that it's very easy to snap back into the old normal. And I think for me, the new normal is, is taking a, a lot fewer things for granted. Um, you know, I think it's, it's brought us face to face with our own mortality uh, and the mortality of those around us and our loved ones. Um, I think it's, it's brought us face to face with how we, how we use our time. Uh, and I think, you know, time is one of the most valuable things that we have and how we allocate that, where we choose to, to focus our time and talents is, is, is very important. And I think, you know, so many of us, you know, myself included, um, got into a mode where we were just kind of going with the flow. Life, life puts us on a certain path and then we simply go from one day to the next without actively, you know, reflecting on the what we're doing and the why. Um, and, and, and so I think that, you know, you're seeing a, a, a new wake up in terms of, 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 of self-reflection, uh, spirituality, uh, of, of people, you know, asking about their purpose. And, and I think there's, you know, there's bad and there's good. I mean, you see rates of, of, of depression and mental illness spiking um, due to the situation. But you also see a lot of people going through a process of discernment, which is not necessarily easy, but which may lead them to a much better place afterwards. And so I think, you know, we all need to ask ourselves the hard questions. Those are individual questions, and they're also questions as a, as a, as a society. And the number of people I've talked to who, you know, I, I wouldn't say are waking up to the issues of political division, of climate change, of, of world poverty, the failure of our educational system, of racial tensions, um, you know, all of these issues were there. And the fact is, you know, this, this is probably an opportunity for us all to, you know, ask ourselves, okay, what's, what's the impact that we can have and ha what, what's the society we want to leave for our children? You know, we're all in, in that sort of in-between generation that has adapted to new technologies, to new ways of organizing our, our, our societies, et cetera. But 
you know, when I look at, uh, at uh, you know, kids in school today, the world they will face, the world my children will face is going to be much, much different. And, you know, I think that I'm much more focused now on, on helping them, on guiding them and in asking themselves the right questions. The Paris Talks podcast is produced by Michael Bahari. Our theme song is Nipe Story by Charmant Mouchardon. Additional music is provided by Pixabay. For more information about this episode and our other projects, please visit paris-talks.com. Christopher can also be found on outcome.co. The journey's not yet with the end. Can you see where you're going?